All right, I'm going to launch a poll here while people start to trickle in. Welcome everyone. As you'll see this poll, um, as you're waiting, uh, is a question just to, uh, we're wondering why, what brought you here? So, um, you know, I'll prompt you to join our webinar. So we have the first option for education purposes. You know, you want to learn more. Um, the second one is project research. You have an upcoming TPRM project. The third one, you're not sure why you're here. So, you know, learn something new or hang out, whatever, whatever works for you. And the last one is your prevalent customers. So take a moment, do our poll. We really appreciate it. Um, and we'll wait a little bit before we start here as everyone starts to trickle in. Hey, Amy, normally I yes. do see the poll, but I'm not. So you might want to check in the background. Oh, the there it is. There you go. OK, thank you for that, Brenda. You're welcome. It's fun to find out why people are attending webinars, because there are so many. Mm -hmm. Nasser and I do so many of them. So we love to know why you <laughs> why you joined to hear, hear what we have to talk about. Yeah, let us know any which way that we can help. Yeah, definitely. So we're seeing a lot of people coming in for education purposes and project research. Some customers, no one is confused yet. So they are here on purpose. So we're good. <laughs> no one's answered that yet. All right, we'll give it about a few more seconds here before we officially get started. So if you see this poll, you're coming in, take a moment, um, choose why you're here. We'd love to know. You know, this, this helps us as we continue with this webinar and um, want to provide the best experience for everyone. All right. Okay, we got a couple more trickling in here. We'll give about 10 more seconds. You've been answered yet. Give us an answer. Okay. All right, I am going to cut the poll and we will officially get started here. All right, so it looks like a lot of people are here for education purposes, as I mentioned before. So, uh, you know, we're excited to learn more with you and share what we know. And without further ado, we wanna welcome everyone. Um, you know, thank you for joining our webinar today, Ace Eight Be Best Practices for Taming the Kraken or the TPRM Beast, uh, featuring Nasser Fatah and Brenda Ferraro. So Nasser is a cybersecurity leader with over 20 years experience in the finance and healthcare industries. And if you've seen Nasser's LinkedIn, you'll see that he probably holds a world record for the most number of industry certifications. Um, and also you'll see Brenda Ferraro, she is our very own Vice President of Third Party Risk here at Prevalent. And my name is Amy Tweet. I am a business development rep here at Prevalent and also your webinar host today. It's my first one I'm hosting, so really excited to be here. And before we officially start, I have a couple of housekeeping items to cover. Um, so first of all, this is a reminder that all attendee lines are muted. We do that in an effort to cut down on background noise, especially since many of us are in our home offices. But we really do want to keep this webinar interactive. So you'll see at the bottom, there's a Q&A section and a chat section. So we please ask that you submit your questions throughout the webinar um, using the Q&A. And we have time at the end of this webinar to um, answer those questions. So we'll address that in the Q&A session. And lastly, uh, today's webinar is being recorded and it will be delivered to your inbox by tomorrow. So if you have to leave early or you want to send this off to someone else that might enjoy it, you'll get that recording. And I know you didn't come here to hear my voice. So at this point, I'm going to turn things over to Nasser and Brenda. Thanks again so much for joining us. Uh, Nasser, take it away. Let's get cracking. Hey, <laughs> You've you got so two much. points. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Amy. Uh, hey, mm -hmm. thanks again for the opportunity to partake. Uh, really uh, always enjoy these moments where we can sit down as practitioners, people who have done this and continue to do this. This is really important work and uh, appreciate the opportunity uh, and especially collaborating with Brenda. So thank you for that. Yeah, I'm excited, Nasser, because I think it was maybe a couple of weeks ago, we were on another meeting and you started talking about this octopus on how TPRM can be built. And so we kind of took that and ran with it and made it the mythical Kraken because TPRM sometimes can be, you know, what is the mystery of this and how do we use it? And what is the, 
main part of the octopus versus all the tentacles that reach out. So it was really exciting that you agreed to do such a webinar. So when you're ready, we'll start asking questions and we'll bounce off of each other until the 45 minute time and then get people to get some questions in. Oh, absolutely. So why don't we kick it off and uh, as always, let's make it collaborative and uh, see what folks on the call may have uh, questions. And, uh, and we'll try to definitely get to your questions uh, sooner than not, but go ahead. All right. So the first thing is a lot of companies are looking at building their TPRM programs. They might call it a third party risk management program. They might call it a vendor risk management program or even a third party risk governance program. But what is fundamental in making an effective TPRM, TPRG or VRM program from the start? Yeah. And, and I like uh, that word fundamental. I'm a strong believer that if you have the right foundation in place, you can always build on top of it, right? There's a, a very a, uh, important adage that I like to say, and that is you can't build the second floor until you have the first floor. So let's make sure the first floor is built with the appropriate uh, solid foundation so you can build on top of that. So I always go to, and I, and I like to keep things as simplistic as possible. So I apologize in advance if it's too simple, but uh, simplicity is always key to me when you talk about fundamentals. So I always go back to people, process, and technology, you know, uh, so when we talk about fundamentals, you know, do we have the right people in place, people with uh, skill sets? You're going to need uh, subject matter experts. Uh, and since we were talking about the Kraken and, and the octopus, you know, I see those subject matter experts, uh, those people who are going to oversee the control posture of the vendors they're going to do business with as being the tentacles, right? You're going to have uh, subject matter experts that are cyber oriented, privacy oriented, business continuity, financial, et cetera. And you definitely need that skill set. So, you know, that's the, the people side of it. And then the other side of the people is, you know, who's governing this uh, for your organization? And, and kind of going back to the octopus, the Kraken analogy, you know, I foresee that being the head of the octopus, right? Where that is the governance piece. That is the one that's making sure that all the tentacles are connected to the body, so to speak, and making sure that uh, everybody's working in synergy. Because if you are doing a review of a vendor, as an example, and one of those tentacles, maybe cyber privacy, is disoriented, disconnected with the rest of the process. That can delay the onboarding. It can cost the uh, business uh, and introduce impact uh, to the business, I should say, because they expect onboarding to happen by a certain time frame, contract to be signed by a certain date. So we've been talking a lot about um, the people side of this. And then we have the process, you know. Do you have policies in place that says, hey, anytime we're going to do business with a third party, we have to follow this policy. In the policy, do you have the key stakeholders? You know, who are the ones that's going to be accountable for the risks associated with the uh, with the vendors? Uh, who are the ones that need to be responsible, not necessarily accountable, for the due diligence piece? Because the business is very good at doing business, but they are not subject matter experts when it comes to privacy, cyber, and so forth. So you definitely need those stakeholders to also play a role, as well as making sure that legal and procurement uh, are in play. And again, when we talk about processes, we're talking about not only policies, what procedures you have in place, what are some do's and don'ts, you know, hey, make sure that if a vendor is going to introduce risk to an organization, do not sign a contract until due diligence is done. So those are process oriented uh, capabilities that you need to make sure. And again, if you don't have a program is starting that off, in those particular uh, simple uh, terms. And then in the end, you know, uh, being able to have technology so you can help your people do their jobs day in, day out and enforce your process. Because if you have uh, extensive um, and intensive, I should say, manual processes, but you're gonna realize that the manual process overcomes uh, people and process overall. So if you're continuously doing things through emails, uh, through spreadsheets and things of that nature, that's not going to scale. That becomes a challenge after a while. and this is why technology becomes really, really, really instrumental because it is gonna help your people to focus on what is it about the risk that I need to do. focus on is gonna help your process when it comes to repeatability, sustainability, uh, consistency. Uh, because if you don't have uh, technology in place, uh, you're pretty much at the mercy of, are people gonna follow the procedures? Or are people going to uh, be as consistent as possible when they are reviewing a vendor? But Again, I, I like to go back to people, process, uh, technology. You saw that I started with the people because if you have technology and you have no people in process, you just bought something that you're gonna put on the shelf. Uh, so I start with the people, make sure you have the processes in place. And then 
uh, once you have your processes documented, your policies in place, your procedures in place, technology will lend itself to that. Not only that, uh, your process would also help you select technology. Hey, this is how my process works. This is how I want to automate my processes uh, using technology. So people process technology is really fundamental. And then when we talk about uh, success, because we talked about fundamental of a TPRM program, but you also have to talk about, hey, what makes a TPRM program successful? I would tell you there's many factors, but probably the two most important one is making sure that the program is aligned with your business strategy. TPRM cannot operate in a vacuum. It has to understand where the business is going. Is the business uh, looking to transform? Is the business looking to get into the cloud, move into new markets, expand, make acquisitions? All those things have impact to TPRM. So making sure that you are aligned with your business strategy from a success perspective becomes really instrumental. And the other success criteria is knowing your customers. Now that you have a TPRM program in place, who are your customers? And you're going to realize that customers can be the business. Hey, I need to onboard this vendor. I need to do this as quickly as possible. That is a customer. I need to figure out what is it about this customer's expectations that you need to be aware of. Uh, some of it is going to be very realistic and some of it may not be realistic. So understanding that and helping your customer through that journey, especially the onboarding piece, because that's where the business happens to be. You also have boards and executives. They're your customers. They want to know, hey, please tell me the risk posture. We know we have a, a vendor portfolio with X number of vendors. Can you please tell me what are the risky things that we should be cognizant of? What are the things that we are deciding to do uh, with our risks associated with our vendors? You may also be in a regulatory space and your regulators are your customers. They expect you to meet regulatory requirements. So you have to make sure your TPR program is aligned with that. And you can see, and I can provide some other example of customers, but you can see that we talked about what is fundamental, starts with people, process, technology, and then what is going to make your program successful, knowing your customers and aligning your service, your TPRM service with your customers and setting the right expectations so that uh, you can be successful in servicing your organization. So I like what you said about people, process, and technology, and you've laid out that you like to start with people and then you go to process and then you go to technology. I do things a little bit differently. I always say that if you have process, you can train your people to use that process and then add technology. So I kind of give a little give and take. And sometimes you already start with the staff. I get that. So you start with figuring out what those people can or can't do. But it's really interesting that you do the other one first and maybe you switch off every once in a while. But I've like been very, very strict where it's like you have to have a process. And then once you have a process, you can train the people. And then after those people are trained, then add technology to make things easier and automated. Does that make sense to you or am I completely no, it, off it, my crack and whacker? No, no, it definitely does. If you, know, if you already have processes in place and your processes are meeting your expectations, then I would say uh, definitely take advantage of that. Like, you know, if you already have really phenomenal documentations when it comes to standard operating procedures, you can bring in new people. You can quickly uh, teach them the process because you have that nicely documented. But if those things are missing, for argument's sakes, then you may need the people to come in and help you with that. And when I mean people, I do mean people in the broadest term. It could be right. um, full-time employees. It could be consultants. It could be a managed service. So it all depends on where you need these people to provide the best service to your organization. So if it's uh, full-time employees, because they are the ones that are going to be looking at your critical and your high-risk vendors, and that is the people that you're going to count on in identifying risk and helping the organization remediate that risk, that's one group of people. You can have contractors and consultants coming in and helping you with either your workload or maturing your process, as an example, because you may not have the people to stop and further mature the process because they're doing their work day in, day out and trying to keep up with the volume that's coming at them. So um, no disagreement. And, you know, when I mean people, I, I do mean people like usually in the broadest way. So talking about people, there's probably a wide range of talent that you need to have. And you've, you've mentioned some of those things, but also including risks, how to address those or having the talent to be able to address the risks. What are your thoughts on, on that tentacle? Yeah, so you know the way I see it is when you're looking at a vendor, you have to look at a vendor from different facets, from different lenses. A, a vendor can introduce, so let me kind of take a step back and just say, hey, vendors provide tremendous value. And I always like to uh, emphasize the importance of vendors. They really are our partners. And often they are making us successful in one form or another. We do business with vendors because uh, they're going to improve our 
customer retention. They're going to improve customer service. Uh, they're going, they have certain skill sets that we simply don't have. They're going to enable us to get into new markets. So tremendous value when it comes to vendors. And there's a reason why we partner with vendors. But like anything, when it comes to uh, partnerships and doing uh, third party, there are risks that may come with that. And that's uh, our job is to identify them in a timely manner so we can make right decisions. So when we look at risk, uh, as I was saying earlier, you know, we have to see it from different lenses. You can have a relationship or about to get into a contract with a vendor that might introduce customer impact because they do not have the appropriate security controls in place, the appropriate cyber controls in place. And that can impact the organization in multiple ways, right? You can impact uh, your customer retention, customer satisfaction. You can impact your regulatory requirements because your regulations expect you to have uh, security controls in place. And different if it's in your shop or with a third party because you still are accountable when you outsource an activity uh, to a third party to make sure that they have the controls in place in the event you don't from a regulatory perspective and even from a best practice perspective. So having uh, those subject matter experts to be able to participate in that review process to make sure that that vendor is being looked at from a 360 angle perspective, from a privacy compliance, uh, ESG, you know, environmental, social and, and governance is a really big topic. Uh, a lot of regulators are talking about it. So you're going to need uh, people who know about ESG. Uh, during COVID, finance was a big concern. You know, uh, what is it about my supply chain, my vendors? that makes them financially stable? Are they going to be able to survive this? Are they going to be able to make uh, next six months? Are they going to be here or not, right? So uh, being able to understand uh, finances uh, associated with the vendor. So you need those types of lenses. And often uh, you'd be lucky if you have one person who can do multiple lenses, right? In this particular conversation, you basically are going to leverage those skill sets that you have in your organizations. And those skill sets, you know, going back to the octopus and cracking, I always see those as the tentacles, right? How are you taking advantage of those tentacles so that cohesively uh, you're working as one single organism, right? Uh, everything is working in sync. Everything is synergized, being holistic. So uh, I would go uh, and say that's really relevant. The other thing I would also uh, like to add, you know, and this is an adage, and we all heard that, you know, it, it takes a village to raise a child. It really takes all the appropriate stakeholders, including the subject matter experts, to safely and soundly onboard vendors. You know, that's a very comparable analogy there. And I would say that not only from the onboarding perspective, because this is a partnership. So it's not a, you reach uh, the contract signature and the end of it. No, no, that is the beginning of it. Now you have to make sure that you're continuing that relationship and whatever expectations you have, that those continue to be met. So if your security posture, your privacy requirements, your disaster recovery, business continuity, uh, your ESG requirements at a certain threshold, uh, you want to continue to measure that because that doesn't deviate. The fact that you now have onboarded doesn't mean that the mission is over. As a matter of fact, you're now starting really to manage that relationship. And this is why when you look at TPRM, you know, third party risk management is that R that I keep underscoring, right? Hey, how are you managing the risk? Because it's not a project. It's not about just onboarding. It's also about what are we going to do now that you've onboarded, making sure that they continue to meet your risk expectations and wherever you see some deviations that you have insight so you can have a constructive dialogue and, and make sure that if it's a concern that that risk is being mitigated or at least uh, brought to senior management, executive board attention so that they can make decisions um, in places where those decisions are best for them to make. I like how you use the word stakeholders because we're oftentimes in the third party area trying to figure out the differences between supply chain, outsourcing chain, compliance requirements, business requirements. And so stakeholders is a really good word to use for that. And in order for the stakeholders to know exactly what is required of them, what is the value of establishing standard operating procedures? Can that help? Yeah, I would tell you the standards in general, you know, and, and, I, I, and I, I like to keep this a little broad, but it's fundamental as well. You know, like if you have uh, a questionnaire, you would like your questionnaire to be as consistent as possible and also as focused as possible. I, I've seen questionnaires and what I mean by questionnaires, these are the questionnaires that we send out to our partners, we send out to our vendors, to our prospects, yeah, so we can better understand their control environment. Uh, often what I've seen is that you cast a really wide net and when you drag that net back in, 
there's so much to review that I would say a good chunk of it may not be relevant. While those things that are relevant, you have to go and start cherry picking. So I would say, you know, having a, a questionnaire that is standard uh, based on your vendor portfolio, and you're going to realize that when you look at your vendor portfolio, you can start to carve out your vendor portfolios in different uh, tranches. You may say, hey, we have vendors that are processing, transmitting, and storing sensitive information. So we need to look at them with this type of lens, with this type of security, uh, and with these types of questions, I should say. You might have uh, vendors that do offshore development. That's all they do, development. So that might represent another tranche of vendors that are significant in your portfolio, and you start to tailor your questionnaire uh, for that group of uh, vendors uh, so that you are standardizing as best as possible. And of course, you know, when I mean by standard, it's also, you mentioned something earlier, Brenda, about, you know, making sure that you have procedures in place and those procedures are current because uh, when you have um, addition to your organization, it is those procedures that they usually gravitate to first. You know, what is it that I can learn about doing the ins and out of my job? They'll gravitate to those procedures. And the better you have that documented, uh, often the better the onboarding experience is. This is not to say that you just give people procedures and walk away from them, none yeah. whatsoever. You know, you still need a, a mentoring program. You still need a little bit of handholding. So I always encourage when you talk about training that there's a mentoring program, but there should be some material there they can reference. They can connect the dots. Uh, also, uh, standard operating procedure gives you consistency. If everybody's following the standard operating procedure, to some extent, there should be consistency. Yes, there's going to be some deviations, but there's always some exceptions, but you should not have great deviations if your procedures are nicely documented and everybody appreciates following them and assuming that uh, it, there's consensus with your procedure. Uh, the other thing that procedure gives is repeatability, right? Hey, you, be, you should be able to repeat whatever that process is because you're following the procedure. So repeatability becomes really important. The other aspect of procedures is auditability. You know, if you are in an organization where you, where you have audit as your third line or just simply have audit, often they start with your procedure. What is it about your day-to-day -day activities and how much of it are you following it? And your procedures from when you identify risk, how do you report risk, how do you risk rate that, et cetera, et cetera, should be documenting your procedures. And again, it becomes auditable and it's good to some extent. And then the last thing I like about procedures and it's not because I'm a document uh, uh, person, but what I like about it is that it gives me an opportunity to go back and say, what is it about my process that I can improve? Because your procedures sometimes will quickly identify what is manual versus what's automated. And then you start to call out those manual processes and say, hey, you know what? There's a lot of manual process in my procedures, and those are opportunities where you can probably automate or look to streamline. So procedures is a nice way of documenting sometimes where indirectly things that you need to improve upon. Yeah, yesterday I spoke on getting out of spreadsheet jail and talked about relevant content gathering and what you said was focused content gathering, which is completely on the same page. And I like how you're talking about the maturity assessment capabilities so that knowing what kind of policies and procedures you have and then having the ability to maybe go back to those people in talent for consulting to say, okay, here's where you are with your program and here's where you can grow. So with a Kraken or an octopus, they have tentacles that can get chopped off at any time from a threat. Those can grow back and things can be replaced. So with that being said, talking about risk in the threat space, why is taking a risk-based approach the right approach for third-party risk? Yeah, I would say, you know, when we look at our vendors in our portfolio, uh, they come in different shapes and sizes. So they come with different risk posture. And that's totally understandable. With some vendors, you're going to rely on them more with your sensitive information. They may have more access to your network. And that's because they're providing you great services. And I keep talking about, you know, the value that vendors bring. But the fact that they're on your network, the fact that they may have a large volume of your sensitive information, that presents risk. So you need to take that risk-based approach so you can decide where you need to devote your resources. Resources is finite. And what I mean by resources, it's not only people, right? I mean, uh, they also have to book their time, et cetera. But you also wanna make sure that when you're looking at it from a risk-based perspective, that you're also now thinking about, hey, when I'm talking about this vendor, what is risky about this vendor? And if they are risk, and often they are, are they significant risk? Are they key risk? Are they risks that can really impact the organization? And if they are, what particular controls should you be looking for 
to make sure those risks are mitigated. So now you start to associate key risk, key control. Hey, if I know my key risk, key control, maybe I should be asking these key questions for my questionnaire. Maybe that is the focus on my questionnaire that I'm gonna zoom in because I now have identified some potential key risks. I could identify what some of the key controls are. And then you start to uh, focus your questionnaire. And then because you know your key risk, key controls, you can also say, hey, these are the key evidence that I'm gonna look for. I have X number of risks that I'm concerned with. Concerned with. I have uh, so many controls that I'm looking to see how you mitigate those risks. And let me see the evidence associated with that. So you're really beginning to scope the uh, due diligence, the review in a very risk kind of manner versus uh, throwing something out there that's really broad and whatever you drag in, uh, you now have to determine is this relevant or not, right? So if you are, if, if you get a questionnaire and it says no to something, uh, it may be relevant, you know, uh, it, it may be, you know, uh, we don't do encryption at risk, using that as an example. And then you realize it's offshore development. You know, uh, when they develop their code, uh, they do not need to encrypt their code per se. Yes, you know, if they're doing any type of key management and things of that nature, that's really uh, something different. But it's being able to associate key risk, key controls to the vendor or the engagement that you're looking at so that you can be very focused. And always bear in mind that you know who your customers are, right? So you always want to be able to do this with the highest quality, make sure that you're doing this uh, so that you can quickly identify risk and then help the business in, or your customers in this case, uh, achieving their objective in a sound and safe manner. So this is you know, why uh, taking a risk-based approach not only lets you focus on what you need to focus, but the turnaround time is usually faster as well. Well, there's a, a main reason why we have KPIs, key performance indicators, and KRIs, K risk indicators, because you're right. If you have risk indicators and you know what your risks are based on the relevant or focused information that you're gathering from your vendors and the engagement that you have with them, then it's much easier to help get you into a posture of preventing some type of a threat from occurring. It doesn't mean that it'll go away. There's always threats looming out there. But what's interesting is I was a CISO. You've been a longer term CISO. We've got, I've got mentors that are CISOs and they always ask me, Brenda, what is our risk tolerance for the company? What should I be watching out for from a security domain perspective? And if you can't slice and dice the risk information in efforts to know what that is, then it's very difficult to tell them. So based on that, why do you think that automation is important for third-party risk management? Yeah, you know, I think one of the, let me tell you one of the challenges not having automation, then I kind of work my way into automation. So if you don't have automation for argument's sakes and you're kind of relying on uh, spreadsheets, uh, email to get evidence back and forth, uh, one, you need to tick and tie those manual processes yourself. I got the, uh, my questionnaire back on the first. I haven't gotten any evidence back yet. Oh, okay, evidence is beginning to trickle in on the fourth. Evidence is beginning to trickle in on the 20th. And now you can see that just that evidence collection process is just growing. And hopefully you have a tickler to say, wait a minute, uh, let me reach out to the vendor and say, hey, I'm expecting all this by this time frame in order for me to do my job, uh, assuming you have that tickler in place. So it becomes really challenging because manually uh, speaking, it's just designed not to be productive. Uh, no ifs, ands, or buts about that. So one of the things that automation does is not only help you in doing your job in a more efficient manner, you know, uh, it also helps those stakeholders. Your vendor is a stakeholder. How do you enable your vendor to quickly provide the type of information that you're seeking? And if you have a vehicle, and I'll use in this particular case, uh, a website where your vendor can go and fill out the questionnaire. They don't have to worry about uh, the questionnaire that you sent them or her an email or submit their standard questionnaire. A lot of vendors uh, comply with SIG, which is a, a standard questionnaire in the industry. For those of you who might be using the SIG, hey, give them the opportunity just to simply upload and, and let the, uh, the business logic of your application ingest that questionnaire and focus on those areas of that questionnaire that are risk to the engagement that you wanna look at. Secondly, you now provided the vendor also with a vehicle to provide evidence. And one thing I would tell you about evidence is as, as good of a vendor wants to be a good citizen and cooperate a thousand percent, often they'll give you something and it'll probably be very good 90%, but there's still gonna be that small percentage where you still have to go back to the vendor. Hey, 
thank you for everything you gave me, but there is two or three things that I still need to know more about, or I reviewed your SOC 2, or I reviewed your ISO document or your PCI uh, rock, and it didn't tell me what I was looking for. So there's always gonna be follow-ups. So you always need to have a vehicle in place to accommodate that, because if you don't have that, often you're gonna rely on email again. And just let's think about this for a second. If you are doing, you know, thousands of due diligence per year, that just becomes, you know, a, a task of futility in just managing uh, what comes in and out through your email. So automation definitely helps with that uh, when it comes to your stakeholders. Uh, I also think it's great when you provide a portal to the business. The business is always, hey, where is my engagement at? What's happening in my engagement? Has the due diligence completed? Is it in contracting? You know, I love Amazon, that approach where when you buy something, Amazon tells you where you're at. Hey, uh, your product just now left the, uh, the distribution center. It's in the truck. Uh, do you want to know where it's at today? You know, I think that type of portal, that type of communication to your business partners, again, they are your customers, right? Uh, it's wonderful because often uh, they get itchy. There's a, a reason why they don't want to do business with a third-party vendor. They want to generate more revenue. They want to reduce costs, et cetera. So no, them knowing exactly where it stands and whom they may have to go knock on the door is a phenomenal thing when you're using automation, right? I've completed the due diligence, it's now in contract. If there's any concerns, go talk to contract. Not because contract is doing anything bad, but at least you know where that's at, uh, simple as that. The other cool thing about automation besides consistency and repeatability, hey, everybody's gonna use the same system. So it's gonna walk that, uh, that group of uh, due diligence uh, risk professionals cyber, business concern, and so forth, it's going to walk them through what the process is, right? So you're going to establish consistency and repeatability. And the other thing that I think that often people overlook is the collaboration. When you're using automation and you have multitude uh, control officers, multitude subject matter experts, I'm going back to the, uh, the Kraken with those tentacles, you know, you want those tentacles to know of each other as much as possible. You don't want them to roaming out there by themselves. You want them to know that, hey, now we have this tool that we can all collaborate. Not only that, we can collect all the documents at one time so that the vendor has given us everything we needed. You don't need to go knock on the vendor's door multiple times. It's kind of, you know, let's operate on the patient while the, the patient's on the operating table. Kind of do everything in one fell swoop. And then the other cool thing, because you're collaborating, you might be able to see risks that you might have not factored in because privacy may say, hey, we identify this concern and now you may say, hey, you know, what? I'm in cyber and the fact that they identify that concern in privacy, I can see that having a cyber concern as well. So the people who are working there can kind of not only corroborate, but also share what they're discovering whenever there are risks and things of that nature. So automation is really a big plus. Uh, and this is why uh, you, you, you sense my excitement when I talk about it. <laughs> and I wrote down eight tentacles as you were speaking why automation is important from my perspective when I'm um, working with companies. Tiering is one of them. It, it, it bridges that gap and challenge and automated tiering. Tagging so that you know specifically what things need to be reportable on PCI or regulatory requirements. Workflow, there's ease of workflow if the statuses change as they go through each of the steps. Evidence refresh, so you talked about documentation and I like how um, you have the ability in some of the platforms, ours is one of them, to put in an expiration date so that you can tell the vendor that something needs to be updated versus waiting for a year and having that information sitting on a shelf. And then you go, oh, wait a minute, I gotta pull this out and make sure that it's up to date or the addendum has been attached. Um, risk normalization, having threat intelligence and responses and other information that's coinciding and correlating together. Um, threat event and incident management has been a big one. So with automation, going and finding out what vendors have been impacted and if they have to remediate, what they need to remediate. And then two more things, transparency you talked about. So the visibility of having status from whatever lens you need to look at it. And then the real-time updates of the VRMDB from the nth party perspective to see all the stakeholder connections so that all those Kraken tentacles know what each other's doing and why they're working together. And then that's the way that you can identify from an automated perspective where you're going to break down. So it's more of a resiliency play. So with that all, um, if you think about the, the operations and the executive boards and the auditors, 
what really are they looking for us in third-party risk management to have in place? Not just based on compliance, but what challenges are they experiencing that we can bridge the gap on from third-party risk? Yeah, I think because risk can be such a broad term, and we talked about a risk-based approach, uh, is you know, w- you know, when you're talking to, and now let me kind of separate this into two audience, but there's by far more audience. And again, see them as your customers, right? Because then you kind of start to understand how to uh, create your TPRM uh, service model, because these are customers you're going to have to address in one form or another. So uh, when it comes to board and executives, uh, they definitely want to know, hey, what are those risks to my vendor portfolio that I need to know so I can make a decision? So if you are giving your board, uh, your execs, uh, vendor risk reports on a monthly basis, on a quarterly basis, such as concentrated risk. Hey, we know we have uh, a lot of investment in this one vendor, or we have a lot of investment in this one geographical location uh, that can uh, have, um, you know, um, nature tends to disrupt that uh, area of the world more often than not, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Those risks become really relevant uh, to the execs and board because they want to be able to make a decision. And in addition to that, you know, what is it that we are doing uh, from a TPRM perspective, in conjunction with the business, in conjunction with other stakeholders, when it comes to not only I'm telling you about these risks, but also let, let us tell you what we're doing about remediating this risk. Because often when you tell somebody about risk, they also want to hear the other side of that. When's it going to be gone? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, what, what is that we're doing about it? And then where we need their support. You know, uh, the boards and execs, uh, usually uh, you're informing them, but I take advantage of that opportunity to say, hey, here's where we need your support. It could be uh, from resources, it could be with, you know, uh, let's kind of get more cooperation from the business, et cetera, et cetera, right? So there could be uh, a lot of reasons for that. Uh, so I would say from uh, how do you articulate that risk? I don't think you have to start from scratch. Uh, often uh, reports that go to the board can be somewhat sensitive, but if you have uh, the opportunity of meeting with the board and you know the secretary, so to speak, there are reports that maybe they'll give you an opportunity to take a look at from a metrics perspective. So you can understand what metrics uh, they are already using that you can leverage. And you would see often it would be, hey, what is it about uh, what we're doing with third parties that can impact our customers, impact our reputation, impact our regulatory, cause uh, unforeseeable fines, things of that nature. So those things can easily manifest uh, from a, a vendor portfolio and being able to capture that, articulate that to the board uh, is really, really important and then be able to establish that report. But you have to be very concise about that risk. And this is why I go about have to be really risk focused because if you're saying something and in the end, the business doesn't think it's a risk, others don't think it's a risk, but you think it's a risk, uh, you really have to know if that's truly a risk or not and articulate that. And again, I like I like to kind of go back to that kind of uh, collaboration, right? So whenever I work uh, on a vendor and I identify the risk, I will always have the conversation with the business. I'll have a conversation with my peers across the table, privacy, business continuity, just to see if it resonated with them. Uh, because I know the significance when you say this is a risk, to some extent, you're asking the vendor to commit time, resources, dollars uh, to fix that. And sometimes it's completely justifiable. They should fix that. But if it isn't, then you start losing some of your credibility with your customers, right? And I go back to your business and things of that nature. So that is one angle. When it comes to audit, I would say that uh, areas that I've seen as a, uh, as a, uh, a challenge uh, when auditors are looking at TPRM, and I respect auditors, as a matter of fact, I was at a, a conference last week where it was TPRM, but 90% of the audience were auditors and how they looked at TPRM. And I thought yeah. that was pretty really fascinating. And often is, and we covered this, Brenda, uh, hey, Nasser, if you did a due diligence, what were the key risks? What do you think, what type of controls you think you expected? What type of evidence did you collect it? And did you tick and tie those things so that if somebody were to pick up the work you did, can come to the same conclusion? And again, this is what I like about automation, because if automation is helping you collect the information, ticking and tying, hey, this is the key risk, this is the key control, here's the evidence we collected, it met our expectation. Somebody who's coming in and taking a look at the good work you did can repeat that as well, because the system will just walk them through. So that audibility trail becomes really important uh, to an auditor. You know, If you started here and you ended there, 
you know, why did you end it there? And what uh, supporting evidence do you have? So being able to walk through uh, your due diligence uh, automation is a, a, a phenomenal thing. So let's move on to continuous monitoring. There are people who are saying that continuous monitoring is for um, threat intelligence or continuous monitoring is just taking your assessment and continuously monitoring their assessment results for their risk. There are some different ways that people are thinking about it. I'm sure I have my own, but what are, what are you, why do you think that continuous monitoring is important and how to leverage it and what exactly continuous monitoring means to you? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question because I know continuous monitoring is a, uh, a broad term and often also gets uh, confused or intermingled with ongoing monitoring. So, so I'm going to keep it at a very simplistic level and then we can definitely go deeper if we like. So I would say that when you're looking at your vendor, as an example, uh, we know even in our own world, even within our own four walls in our organization, the threat landscape is constantly changing. Uh, and, and things can happen pretty quickly. You know, you can have a, a vendor being subjected to a, a cyber attack or a vendor who unfortunately experiences data exfiltration. It, this can happen fast and furious. And we know that data breaches have not slowed down, right? Data breaches are gonna continue. And, you know, uh, and, uh, and, and nation states and, and cyber criminals also realize that, hey, you know what, if I cannot um, hack you as an organization, let me see if I can hack one of your vendors because often your data is at the vendor side, right? So they are thinking out the box and this is what makes uh, them uh, kind of savvy to a large extent. So the threat landscape, the threat landscape is constantly changing. Uh, as professionals, we know that we need to do due diligence on an ongoing basis. And this is why in our policies, you may have a cadence established such as uh, we're going to look at our critical vendors every six months, a high risk vendor every year, et cetera, et cetera. You have that cadence established, but what happens in between? Right. You, you need to know. You just can't say, you know what? Let me just wish you the best and I'll see you six months from now. And hopefully- Thank you for that information. We'll go on from here, whether you have risks or not. That's so dangerous. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so you need to have that purview and you need to have that ongoing information. It's no different than, hey, I always look at my- weather app on my phone before I go out so I would know how to dress appropriately, right? So I am taking a risk-based approach, right? I don't want to go out there with shorts if it's going to be freezing, as an example. And I don't want to go out there with a coat if it's going to be blistering hot. So I'm always looking at what's happening in the landscape. This was the weather-wise example, but threat is very comparable and, and threat does change uh, very often. So you definitely want to have your finger on the post when it comes to what is it about the threat landscape and what is it about your vendor portfolio that might be getting impacted. So that's one. Uh, the other is with continuous monitoring, you are going to get information and often you're going to build a level of confidence and assurance based on that information. And that will come with experience, meaning that uh, once you start subscribing, uh, you may not be totally convinced on day one, day 10, day 30, but you're going to realize what's good and what's not so good. And that's okay. And that's because you're getting a lot of information and your vendor should be helping you in crafting the appropriate signal uh, when you're doing continuous monitoring for the rest of the noise that might be happening. But one of the coolest things is that if you are seeing, hey, I just did a due diligence uh, or I am doing a due diligence with this vendor. And I noticed that patching is coming across as great vulnerability management is coming across as great, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm getting a report that's contradicting that. It's telling me something different. You can now have an intelligent conversation. I'm not telling you to take sides. All I'm telling you is that now you have another piece of information that is usually independently verified that mm -hmm. you can come in and have an intelligent conversation with your vendor and say, listen, you're telling me that these four controls are up to par, but we are seeing something different. Can you explain that to me? They may have a rationale. Oh, by the way, those are not your systems. Oh, by the way, those are not your sites. Oh, that is uh, out in Europe, your business, we conduct all in the United States. They might be some valid explanation, but you have data points that you can have an intelligent conversation around because I have discovered where half of it, they were able to justify. The other half, the vendor said, yep, we need to fix that. And it so happened that they gave me a SOC report that was nine months old and something happened the last three months. And that's because the threat landscape is constantly changing. So that's uh, one, uh, another good reason to have a continuous monitoring. And then the other thing I would say is that you can also use it for your due diligence. Hey, when you're doing uh, 
an assessment on the vendor. We know we're going to look at the key risks, key controls. What is it about your continuous monitoring capabilities that gives you some insight to some of those controls? The more controls you get from your continuous monitoring, the more confidence you have in those controls, the less you have to be dependent on your vendor because I gave you the example where they could be giving you very legitimate SOC reports. This is less than a year old, which is usually a rule which of thumb. Which is what people time. ask for, right? Exactly. But what if something happened last month? Exactly. So, so this is why this helps. The, the, the uh, continuous monitoring helps in that fashion. And then other people, uh, what I tell them is that don't create these boundaries on continuous monitoring. Extend that. Again, go back to that service model. You can use it for merge and acquisition. If your company is doing merge and acquisitions, what is it about that acquisition that you can get some visibility into now? If your company is looking at four vendors, they don't know which one they're going to go with. You can help them with their scorecard. Hey, let me just go back and see what the rating is and let me come back and give you. That's or sourcing and procurement. Yeah, and it's, it's used very heavily there in some aspects. Yeah. So, you know, I say that, you know, uh, continuous monitoring is a relevant, important tool in your toolbox, but it is not a panacea. You know, sometimes I, I hear people say, well, I don't need to do a due diligence because I have continuous monitoring. I would say that it will only work in very, very um, unique cases. And a couple have, of the tentacles, a couple of the tentacles will be covered, but not the policies and not the checkpoints of the building. <laughs> no, you're, you're, you're right. So, so this is why I'm saying that when I hear that, you know, to me is it must be a very unique niche because often uh, continuous monitoring is really good in what it does, but it does not, it is not meant to be a replacement of your full due diligence program. It looks like Amy's come back, which means we're at 15 minutes and we wanted to leave enough time for questions. And I've seen a couple of them pop up in the chat. Not too sure how much we have in Q&A, but Amy, we will hand it over to you. Yeah, we have a couple questions here, and this is a good time to answer, uh, ask any questions you do have for these two experts. So um, use the Q&A function, ask some questions. But one that came in, um, how do you convince the board the need for continuous monitoring? So I'll go back to the example, Gabe, and I'll give the floor to Brenda. So I, I talked about the threat landscape is constantly changing. So if you don't have that visibility of what is changing out there, and it does change, by the way. I mean, uh, if you want to look at uh, an example of, a quick change would have been solar winds, right? So that happened and, and now you need to respond. Uh, but the fact that you need to keep your finger in the pulse on the threat landscape, uh, continuous monitor definitely gives you that visibility, that insight. If you don't have that, you are to a large extent uh, getting that information in your next visit or getting that information from the news or from some third party that might not be necessarily reliable. But you know, that's what I usually tell uh, board members, you know, how do we help them manage foreseeable risk and identify them in a timely manner after we have done our due diligence, but we still need to keep uh, our eyes on uh, the threat landscape and potential risk that might manifest from that. And I have a couple things to add to that. I completely agree with Nasser. When you use a trust, verify and validate process for risk-based decisions, you will use a questionnaire and you'll get content and you're trusting your vendor to tell you that what they have in place is actually effective and enforced. And some of the boards, many of the boards are going to this zero trust approach. And so in order to adopt that, the continuous monitoring is going to give you that level of information that balances out with the collected content that you get. Not only does it do that, but it also will give you alerts when alerts happen. You'll have thresholds that you set to figure out which exactly is something that is uh, of warning to you that you want to keep an eye on, such as ransomware, or if there's anything with regards to IP addresses or hacker chatter, or whatever that might be. There's business and financial information. So if something's going awry with those two things, you'll be able to use that with your stakeholder um, connections and links within your VRMDB. And also when you have the ability to use the threat intelligence and the collected content NAS NASA, the one thing that I've found is that people aren't going on site to do on site visits anymore to confirm that everything is to par. And so what happens is they take this questionnaire response and they take the content from the continuous monitoring threat intelligence that gets normalized and becomes the scope that they're going to do a virtual assessment instead of an on-site assessment to test those protocols. So um, that's that's what I would add to what Nasser said to answer that question. 
and you, but you said something really important that I think is worth underscoring. That is, you know, uh, continuous monitoring from what I have seen from different vendors would also provide you negative news. You know, what is it that's being out there that is going to show up in a Wall Street Journal, New York Times, board members are constantly reading uh, that type of uh, material on a daily basis and their morning breakfast and so forth. The and first thing they ask is, oh my gosh, I read this in the news, are we hit? <laughs> Exactly. So, so I, it would be nice to say, yep, we are aware of it. Here's what we're doing about it. And we know exactly what area of concern that negative news is affecting us. You know, you can quickly see if that negative news has to do with uh, some cybersecurity controls, if it has to do with lawsuits, if it has to do with whatever that negative news is. But being able to keep uh, abreast of that is one. And then the other thing that's really important that people kind of overlook, now that I know this, how do I track this into improvement? Right. How do I now keep an eye on this? So I am comfortable that this is going in the right trajectory because you now found out something that uh, you needed to know. The other part of continuous monitoring is how do I now keep my finger on the pulse? How do I put this on a watch list so that as long as it's going in the right trajectory, I'm okay with it. If it keeps declining, Again, I need to escalate that, have a conversation with the business, with the vendor, potentially even report that to boards and executives because this might impact them uh, when it comes to uh, their concerns on a daily basis. Yeah, great. Thank you both. A uh, couple more questions here. So if a business is trying to move their TPRM program away from spreadsheets and onto a more sophisticated approach, what advice would you give and what's the high level process that is involved? You want to go first, Nasser? Sure. You know, first thing I would say is, you know, take a look at your process and you definitely want to have some quick wins. Uh, what I have seen as gotchas or no-nos is when people try to create this big bang uh, introduction of automation and it just becomes um, too overwhelming sometimes even to the organization. So I would say, you know, uh, look to first introduce it build your inventory as an example. So, hey, I'm gonna start with my inventory, my criticality rating and collecting documents, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I would start in the simplest way, show that the solution can definitely do that. And then you start to introduce other aspects of your process, such as now I'm going to make it uh, internet facing, I'm gonna give the vendor the opportunity to uh, submit the questionnaires, uh, provide their evidence, but to start in a place that you know you're going to have immediate success and you can immediately build upon that. You know, if you're looking to introduce too much of a big bang, I'm going to do these hundred things with automation. It just becomes overwhelming. Not to mention the fact that when you introduce automation, you also have to provide training. And that's something that people overlook. Hey, I just introduced this whole new technology. Good luck with it. That will never work. Right. So part of it is getting the right stakeholders. I go back to that cracking with the octopus, with the all those legs. Hey, what is it about those uh, tentacles that you need to get their cooperation? What is some of their biggest pain points? How do you get buy-in for them so that they can become your biggest users, your biggest advocates? So this is not something that is independently done. This is done in a collaborative effort because when it's done right, everybody that participates, even the business, uh, wins because now they get the reports they're looking for. They get but everybody knows you're going to start someplace. Uh, and so I would say, you know, learn where you need to start. Start with the basics, inventory, criticality rating, uh, your, your workflow process, document collection, et cetera, and then grow upon that. But make sure you have uh, the successes so you continue to get buy-in for the growth that you like to do with your program. Yeah, I would agree. The roadmap is a really good approach. I would kind of peel back just a tiny, tiny bit that feeds into everything that Nasser said and say, that when you create the capability of migrating from I'm using Excel to going into a platform, the things that you're going to want to understand is what are your service level targets for how long do these vendors have to complete because you're able to configure in the reminders and the emails and what do you really want to say to those vendors? Do you want to use a hard hammer or do you want to use a soft hammer when you talk to them through the emails to remind them to say, hey, welcome to the program. Here's the portal that you're going to go to. Here's what's going to be expected. Here's how long you have. And then remind them seven days or 15 days or however long they need for reminders. The other thing is, um, if you're using a spreadsheet, you can take that spreadsheet if it's not already a standard and map it to a standard and start using the standard because some portals like ours have already been mapped to different 
compliance regulatory requirements so that as these co the contents coming back in, then you'll already know that there's different ways that you can visualize that information, whether it's for GDPR or NIST or ISO. And the other thing is get other departments involved. So if you're asking a questionnaire and they're asking questionnaires, why not consolidate that into one and ask the relevant questions all at once so that your vendor is not constantly hit by every department in your company to get information so that they could do their own risk management. So use that Kraken approach where everything is all consolidated in one place and they're reaching out with each of those tentacles. What do you think, Nasser? Are you in agreement? A hundred percent. You know, and I like that collaborative piece, right? It's done in collaboration. You know, one of the things that you said that reminded me of, I remember when uh, we would send, uh, we're going to conduct a due diligence. And if you don't coordinate with the right stakeholders, it can be a very lonely journey. And not only a lonely journey, it can be very frustrating. So I'll give it's an very example. Impact, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'll give you an example, right? So uh, what we did was every time we did a due diligence on a particular vendor, we brought in the business. Hey, who owns this relationship? Because you have a vested interest that we are collectively successful. I want to make sure you're a successful business. I want to make sure vendor you're successful. And I want to make sure I'm successful because I have a job to do. So I would collaborate in that fashion, which automation can immediately lend itself to. Because if the vendor was not cooperating for whatever reason, I'm not trying to call, I'm not trying to say for mischievous reason, but for whatever reason, uh, the business now knows that there's going to be a delay and it's not NASA's fault because I brought in the business. I was very collaborative. And if I do not get what I need to get, I still have other work to do. I have to move on to other work. So it was a very uh, conducive way of building partnership and getting buy-in. And if the vendor goes, you know what, I'm sorry, but I'm short of staff. I'm going to need another two weeks. The business is immediately apprised of that. So now they know that the due diligence is going to be held off by two weeks. It's not because NASA is holding them back. It's because logistically the, the vendor just cannot accommodate and I continue doing that. So that means a collaboration is extremely important and setting those expectations. You know, again, I go back to collaboration and do work with your vendors, your business, all those other stakeholders as they are your customers, because that will really help set the mind tech. Agreed. Awesome, thank you both. We're about two minutes to the top of the hour here. and I wanna make sure we have time for our last poll question. I will be launching that in just a moment. Um, Brenda, I think you're winning for the Kraken points at least. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say, thanks for the octopus facts too. I, I learned something here. Well, um, Nasser, he came up with this a couple of weeks ago and probably has been talking about it for a while, but I just latched onto it so fast. <laughs> That's great. All right, I'm going to launch this last poll here for those of you still here joining us. Um, so last question, are you looking to augment or establish a third party risk program in 2021? Really simple. Yes, no, I'm not sure. Uh, we really appreciate you answering this question. Um, if you are looking to augment um, or, you know, establish a new program, um, Amanda and I are happy to connect with you um, from the business development side and, you know, share what we know and connect you with um, an expert here if that is the case. So answer honestly, we really appreciate it. Um, we'll wait a few more seconds here as some answers start trickling in. So oh, somebody you. said that they yeah. like the Kraken and it's because the tentacles grow back. They do. So I watch yes. Netflix. There's a documentary. It's either Netflix or Hulu because COVID had me watching TV a lot. But anyway, and I didn't have COVID, but just the COVID time frame. <laughs> being stuck in a house. <laughs> so um, I hope everybody is healthy, but this, this documentary was just phenomenal. And when we think about third-party risk management and having threats come at us all the time and being protective of our tentacles, it's just, it's so awesome. You could put so many analogies to it. So you all can walk around now saying crack on or crack in. <laughs> Love <Absolutely>. it. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess we're getting close here to the top of the hour. Thank you both so much. Thank you everyone for joining us. It was really uh, great to have you here. We learned a lot, especially about Krakens. Um, and if you need anything else, you know, we're here to help. Please reach out. Um, otherwise, that's it for me. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Nasser. No, thank, thank, you, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Always fun. Take care. Folks. Talk to you thank again you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.